Good afternoon, I'm Maria Urbina with Voto Latino. Welcome to our discussion today. We're so excited for our audience to be joining our amazing partners who are hosting us today. With me today, I have Kathy from Demos, and we also have Joanna from Latino Justice Pearl Death. Before we get started, we wanna invite you to join us online. Please leave comments. And we also wanna remind you that um, our conversation today is being guided by comments and questions that our audience has left. If we don't get to your question, please leave it in the comments section and our experts here, here will follow up with you with resources um, and tools. In addition to that, before we get started on our conversation about sanctuary policies and these, uh, a great report that both of these ladies worked on, we want to remind you that this is not legal advice. This is an educational conversation. If you require legal advice, please seek an attorney. Um, pardon me. You will need to consult and speak in confidence about your individual situation with an attorney. Um, but we're really excited and, and pleased we welcome your, your feedback um, and your questions and we feel that this conversation is especially timely considering a lot of the terrorizing that's happening throughout the country with our communities um, and most significantly and most recently many of us have been really um, feeling the pain of Lupita's, families, Lupita's family out of Arizona um, and we'll continue to stand in solidarity with immigrants um, and our families. So, with that, let's get started with our first question. And ladies, if you wanted to say anything to introduce yourselves, if not, we'll go ahead and get started with the questions. No, let's get started with the questions. Great. Thank you. Okay, so Kathy, our first question. Um, please give us a definition of the word sanctuary city. What is sanctuary? So there actually is no one precise definition. Sanctuary can mean a number of different policies, different ways that jurisdictions and churches and schools can provide <clears throat> some form of shelter. Um, it means non-cooperation with draconian immigration enforcement, and it means shielding um, immigrant communities from abuse of power. The movement, as we know it today, was developed in the 1980s when churches decided to provide sanctuary for Central Americans um, who were fleeing for their lives from dictatorships in, um, in Central America, and the U.S. Uh, decided not to give them asylum. So churches decided to provide sanctuary. And it also draws on the tradition of the abolitionist movement, uh, which also has a legal history here in the United States. We've seen a boom in the sanctuary movement among churches and cities and schools and even five states, um, which Joanna will talk about. Yeah. Actually, there are over now 633 counties, five states, and 39 cities that have some form of sanctuary policy. And as Kathy mentioned, what that means in practice at the very basic level is that they are refusing or refraining from cooperating with federal immigration enforcement in the sense that they're not expending uh, local monies to, uh, to carry out uh, the federal uh, immigration enforcement mandates themselves. And the reason they can do that, and we'll talk about, we'll get into this in a little bit, is because um, under the 10th Amendment, a number of local jurisdictions have a right to provide for the safety and security of, of their own community, their own residents, um, and they cannot be coerced by the federal government to enforce federal immigration law or any other federal laws without funding. Um, and the current uh, legislation that provides block grants and funding to these lo localities actually cannot be removed constitutionally because those funds themselves, what well, we argue in the report, those funds themselves have nothing to do with immigration enforcement. So we argue that constitutionally they can't be removed and we talk about several cases in the report um, one of which is NFIB versus Sebelius, which basically states, more or less, uh, it's a different case, it was in 2012 about the Affordable Care Act, but essentially it states that uh, the federal government cannot coerce localities into uh, assuming its role, essentially. And it cannot do that in a way that would amount to a gun to the head uh, with threats to withdraw funding or without providing any funding. And there were also two other cases, Prince and New York. One was about gun control, one was about nuclear waste disposal. Those were actually authored by the late those decisions were authored by the late Justice Antonin Scalia, and they actually uh, prohibit uh, federal commandeering of local governments. So the federal government cannot commandeer cities and states to do its bidding. Great, and Joanna, could you walk us through a little more? Um, you mentioned a few jurisdictions in there, but if you could touch upon those again, and then yeah. also touch upon what exactly these policies look like in practice. Yeah, so uh, several of those jurisdictions include the state of New York, oh sorry, the city of New York, let me clarify, the city of New York, the state of New York, the Attorney General actually recently released some guidance for cities to, uh, and some model uh, policies for cities to create their own sanctuary policies. But the state of California itself has an act called the Trust Act, um, which is enforced throughout the state and a number of municipalities in California, including San Francisco, actually recently sued 
uh, the executive administration um, regarding their recent executive order on sanctuary cities and funding threats uh, because they, uh, they actually do not cooperate with the federal government. They, they do have a law in the state of California that, does not, that, that states that um, people cannot be held longer than the time they're being held for an arrest um, or for a jail, you know, jail time for, immigration, for the purposes of immigration detention unless it's a very serious felony. There's actually currently a bill on the books right now that's going through the legislature in California that would expand that um, beyond uh, folks that don't have, that have a felony and actually not cooperate at all with the federal government. Um, and also to provide some legal assistance for folks facing administrative civil deportation hearings. Great, and Kathy, did you want to um, touch upon that topic any further? Yeah, I mean, I think if we're talking about the different types of policies, one reason, um, in addition to the 10th Amendment, that these policies are allowed is because the Fourth Amendment protects people from um, being held or detained or, um, or arrested based on a civil law violation. So at the outset, it's really important for everyone to know that being undocumented is a civil law violation. So many of these policies are around local law enforcement, including police and, and, and corrections, not detaining based on uh, an ICE detainer request unless there's probable cause. And in the past, ICE detainer requests didn't have probable cause. We do believe that with this new administration, it's very much less likely that these requests will have probable cause. So um, the other component is that information about immigration status can be shielded from the federal immigration enforcement apparatus through very well-crafted privacy policies. You can take a look at our report online and at the, um, also at the New York Attorney General's opinion to see those types of policies. Police should not be asking about immigration status and di discrimination based on immigration status is prohibited. There are legal services for people in deportation proceedings that some um, jurisdictions are enacting. Um, to the extent legally possible, public benefit should not depend on immigration status, so people can go to the hospital if they need it. And actually, most importantly, in schools, schools absolutely need to be a sanctuary. K through 12 schools may not um, cooperate with any type of immigration enforcement because everybody, regardless of their immigration status, has the right to equal access to education. So those are some of the main components. Um, it's almost like a cafeteria style plan right now. So sure. whatever works in the jurisdiction is what, what folks start off with. And if they can enact all of it at once, great. And um, you know, if not, piece by piece works too. Sure. Yeah. And so in practice, mm -hmm. um, how do these sanctuary policies kind of perhaps more explicitly protect undocumented immigrants? So specifically, um, in an interaction with the local police, the local police will not be sharing immigration status information or detaining you based on any sort of request for detention that comes from the federal government, unless of course there's a judicially um, or magistrate's warrant with probable cause, and that's criminal probable cause. So that's one of the main components. For shielding information, um, what jurisdictions like New York City and Chicago and other places are doing is fighting back about sharing inf information about immigration status from, let's say, the DMV um, or um, the public hospitals um, or the schools with the federal government. So there are policies that shield that information so that it's private and it is not given over to the federal government. Okay. Um, so those are a couple of the main ways that they operate to help protect. Right. And actually, yeah, and, and this reason, you know, the reason the California Trust Act was called the Trust Act is it was meant to engender trust among immigrant communities, particularly immigrant communities of color, because of the concerns that jurisdictions have about enforcing federal immigration law. There's a big risk of liability, and we'll talk about some of the cases we cite in the report, some of which Latino justice itself we have litigated here, including Santos um, in the Fourth Circuit in Maryland, that prohibit violations of equal protection. So any kind of discriminatory racial profiling would be prohibited, and the risk that local jurisdictions take when they try to enforce federal immigration law is a risk of racial profiling. So we talk about that in the report and why that's too high a risk for jurisdictions to stomach. We can, also- Can you briefly, uh, in practical sense for the yeah. audience, what that, you know, if that is a real liability for these um, police jurisdictions or other governmental jurisdictions, what does that look like in practice, as much as you can say, to an ordinary person who might feel like they're a victim of racial profiling. Yeah, actually I can tell you about the Santos case. Great. So Roxana Santos was actually sitting outside eating lunch when she was stopped by the Frederick County um, police in Maryland. Um, and she was detained and questioned while they, based on the, the case, the papers in the case, they seemed to be looking up and talking with their dispatch to see if there was a deportation 
order out for her. Now that deportation order that they ultimately found after they had detained her without what the court later found to be probable cause, they had no constitutional probable cause to detain her in the first place, um, they, they found a civil immigration warrant. And so the court in Santos in the Fourth Circuit held that it's actually unconstitutional, it's a violation of the Fourth Amendment for someone to be detained on a civil deportation warrant because there is no criminal probable cause for their detention. The other thing, um, our President General Counsel, Juan Cartagena, wrote a piece called Eating While Brown on, in, for the Huffington Post that talked about the fact that she was just sitting there eating her lunch and she was stopped and it appeared for no other reason than her appearance, her race. So on a prohibited ground, um, potentially. So these are, these are some of the concerns. There's another case out of the Third Circuit called Galarza where a Puerto Rican man was actually stopped and detained on a mistaken <laughs> uh, immigration uh, order grounds. And uh, you know people have common names and they can be confused, and so there's another risk there as well. But again, Galarza showed that there's a risk um, of violations of both the Fourth Amendment and equal protection. There's another case, even another. Uh, out of the Seventh Circuit, um, that actually it, that actually protects folks in a number of states in the Seventh Circuit from these types of orders directly from DHS itself, because there were concerns about DHS um, not following some of the administrative procedures sure. at the federal level when sure. stopping people and actually stopping people on these civil orders and not criminal. And this case is outlined in the report. All of these cases are outlined right. in the report, and they're part of a growing roster of cases across the country. Uh, including in Oregon, that show that these cases are too high of a constitutional risk for cities and states to take. Okay, so now we're going to move on to a question that was submitted by a member of our audience, uh, Voto Latino. So their question was, even in sanctuary cities, we're seeing raids and people being arrested. What do you do beyond making sure people know their rights? What are some strategies around community deportation defense when ICE doesn't respect local will? So maybe also um, touching upon um, uh, what Know Your Rights looks like, even just kind of an abbreviated version, and, and folks can follow up with, there are many great toolkits, United We Dream has a really great toolkit, and others um, on Knowing Your Rights, but if you could also touch upon the second part. Yeah, I mean, there's a number of strategies that local governments, schools, churches, community-based organizations and networks can engage, um, including some direct action to support community members who are being targeted. Um, obviously very sensitive to people's privacy and confidentiality needs, um, but this includes fact-based reporting about any federal overreach like we just discussed. Um, and so the best place to do that is really to follow um, the United We Dream Here to Stay Action Network. If you are a citizen or any concerned member you know, of society who wants to do something about this and stand up for immigrant rights, they, they have coordinated actions and ways that you can do that that are respectful of people's privacy and also of people's constitutional rights. Kathy, did you have anything else you wanted to add to that? No, there's a number of tools that we're going to post um, you yeah. know, in this chat. And I say it, some of the tools about um, have been developed from the Black Lives Matter movement. We're going to talk a little bit more about criminal justice reforms. But many of the tools that communities of color have been using to um, help to document abuse of power um, also apply in the immigration context. And so we'll share those tools and um, hope that, f that folks get involved. Great, thank mm -hmm. you. Um, Here's another question from our audience. What if you have a clean record and you need to work for your kids and you have no other family to help? What do you do? So I guess let me let me just start with that. Um, uh, you know, President Trump issued another executive order on January the 25th. It didn't get as much attention yet as the other executive order that has been litigated and, and folks have heard about the travel ban, um, which is also just draconian. Uh, but this executive order changes the priorities for immigration enforcement and deportation. And if you look at just the text of that executive order, a person in your situation wouldn't be subject to priority for deportation. But on the other hand, um, you know, the executive order says that it's going to, um, you know, it's going to target people based on a chargeable offense or possibly being a public safety or national security threat or using public benefits. In other words, it has quite a lot of vague language that we think is going to be unconstitutional in its application. Um, so there's, um, you know, even though um, you're not a priority, there is some risk um, considering that the raids that we've seen and the immigration enforcement actions that we've seen, you know, behind that executive order um, by the current administration. Um, so um, it's better to be in a sanctuary jurisdiction, but even a sanctuary jurisdiction can't stop ICE from coming in and doing its own enforcement. So we want to be very clear about that. 
However, if you're in a sanctuary jurisdiction, if you have an interaction with local officials, it's not going to lead to being identified by the federal government. Yeah, and yeah. that being said, it's important to have an emergency plan in place, even though, as Kathy said, we do believe these orders may be unconstitutionally vague and challengeable. Mm -hmm. um, it's important to have an emergency plan in place to contact um, your local bar association or legal aid here in New York. The Legal Aid Society of New York is providing some uh, pro bono or low bono legal assistance to families to provide for emergency situations. So if your children are US citizens or have, you're a mixed status family and you want to provide for your children if anything should happen to you when you're not at a safe place inside the city, in a school, or in a church, or with them and you're, you're separated them some, from them somehow, to provide a plan in place for guardianship of your children just in case. Um, mm -hmm. It's important to be prepared, not to panic, but to be prepared. Um, and as Kathy said, even in the sanctuary jurisdiction, mm -hmm. um, to have that preparation plan in place. And don't sign anything until you speak to an attorney. The other thing that's really important um, is to have uh, some kind of Know Your Rights card with you. Uh, this is a card that's developed by the Immigration Legal Resource Center. It's available for free. You can get it online. It's another resource we'll provide in the links below. But it says in English and Spanish um, what your rights are, that you're exercising your Fourth Amendment rights because federal immigration officers also cannot enter your home without a warrant. So um, you know, if you don't know who they are and they're not showing a warrant and they're banging on your door, um, you can also have this card available and you can slide it under the door so they know that you, you are aware of your rights and you're exercising your right um, to refuse to let them to enter without a warrant. And if they do have a warrant, that you wish to speak with an attorney. Okay, thank you. Um, another question. What are the fundamental constitutional and civil rights every person has regardless of immigration status? Um, let me go ahead and start and then I'll pass it to Joe. Um, so I would refer people to our report, um, and uh, you know, there's there's a lot of citations to the equal protection and due process cases that um, that Joe has been discussing, um, and that case law hasn't gone away. Um, one thing that I was really glad to see in the Ninth Circuit opinion that came out recently, um, basically stopping the travel ban that targeted Muslims, is that um, the, the the Ninth Circuit. Um, cited a number of cases saying that everybody, every person in the United States or everybody subject to the jurisdiction of the United States has these fundamental rights to due process. So the fundamental right to due process, just to break it down, is just as Joe just said, you cannot be detained unless you are um, a person who is subject, for, for whom there is probable cause of committing a crime or if it's a federal immigration authority that they have probable cause that um, you have violated the immigration laws. Um, the other thing um, is that there are constitutional rights for these cities and states and um, counties to pass um, the types of laws that we want at the local level. I'm very glad that I live in Montgomery County, Maryland, in a, in a place that has sanctuary and our local institutions don't cooperate with federal immigration officials. And I just want to also emphasize the importance of these policies in schools. There are heightened protections for school children, especially in public schools K to 12. This has been, this is very clear. There is a right to equal protection and equal access to education. This comes from the doctrine from the Brown versus Board of Education case and then the Plyler versus Doe case and then the case against the state of Alabama. Status-based discrimination um, that makes status-based differences between how a person, how a child is able to learn in school is a violation of equal protection. So that means that schools cannot be asking about yours or your parents' um, immigration status information, um, and they cannot be cooperating with the federal government. We also know that folks have the right to freedom from hate crimes, and you can find more information about that in our report. Mm -hmm. Did I cover everything? Uh, I think almost everything. I think the other piece to remember um, is, you know, going back to those cases, equal protection and, and due process, is again, um, going back to the racial justice component, mm -hmm. um, that you cannot be stopped for these prohibited grounds. So if you feel that you've been stopped and you've been discriminated against on, a, on the basis of race, on the basis of your language access, your language ability, or your national origin, and that you've been stopped without probable cause, mm -hmm contact, say, reserve your right to speak with your attorney and contact an attorney immediately because you may also have a constitutional case on your hands. Yeah. Great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and there are a, a, a litany of reports that you've yeah. all worked on this sort of intersection of, of race and immigration. Um, so we'll definitely want to include those. Um, we notice from our platform a lot from our audience that 
our, our community is really, really deeply interested in this intersection, um, largely because they're targeted on both fronts, um, mm -hmm. or at least cautious on both fronts. Um, moving on to another question, how can we be notified when someone in the area needs our help? Um, just going back to the resources, uh, we'll provide some more below and the links below, but United We Dream Here to Stay Action Networks uh, Raid Watch is the hashtag that folks are using on social media, again, to be respectful of privacy, of folks' privacy and constitutional rights. Um, it's important to plug into what grassroots organizations that are mobilizing together with legal organizations are doing to make sure that people's rights are protected and to report um, when unconstitutional raids are occurring and actually to investigate and litigate. Great, thank you. And now we're going to open it up. Um, we have an amazing team here today who's been jotting down some questions from the audience live. So we're going to take a few questions that have been live. So the first live question, can you tell us more about the weekend raids? Are they legal? Yeah, I'll start. So we actually don't have a lot of information. I think one of the things that's happened, you know, since January 20th is that, you know, um, we don't get information from the DHS the same way that we used to. So, you know, if we're at the airport, we can't always talk to the Border Patrol folks. And if we're asking ICE about what happened with the raids, it's very hard to confirm what happened. But we do have credible reports that not only people who, um, um, are subject to a warrant um, because um, you know a warrant has been issued because of um, violation of immigration laws have been targeted, but also anyone else in the vicinity. Um, and we've had some credible reports of traffic stops and things along those lines. So folks are just you know asked for their documents. I know in my home state of Maryland, um, you know the local police actually asked a, a woman um, um, who's Indian American, you know, do, can you, can I see your papers? Right. So show me your papers, laws are the type that folks have litigated against. Sheriff Joe Arpaio in Arizona have litigated against in, um, in California, in Alabama. Um, and so there's a number of things in the application of, the, of, of, of um, you know, this heavy enforcement action that we um, feel are very likely to be unconstitutional, including racial profiling. We've seen it right and left for decades now. There's no reason to believe that it's not happening under you know, this new um, administration and their executive order to just deport millions. And both community organizations and, and folks on the ground up to um, congressional leadership, I know today the Congressional Hispanic Caucus called for a meeting um, by um, DHS officials or ICE officials to get more clarity on what is actually happening. So it's really important also to be continuing to weigh in with um, congressional leaders and others who can weigh, on, weigh in with these agencies. Next question. Please give examples of how we can support sanctuary cities. I'll start. Okay. Um, so one of the things you can do is if you're you know, active in your community um, and you're in a position of uh, relative safety and privilege, you should leverage that privilege um, to pressure your city council, your local jurisdiction. You can actually take a look at our report. You can take a look at some of the other resources we've provided, the New York AG's legal guidance mm -hmm. for cities in the state of New York um, and others to provide some model legislation. Actually, the city of New Jersey, six days ago, uh, after the executive order, recently passed their own legislation, um, their own sanctuary city legislation, really um, laying it out. So there are model examples of policies that localities uh, can enact. Um, and you can present that as a citizen, as a resident, um, who is in a position where you feel safe and you have that power to exercise. And if, even if you aren't in a position of privilege and power, I think uh, folks have been talking about United We Dream, it's important to stay strong and stay visible to the extent that you can, um, but also be mindful and be ready with your emergency plan. And one of the pieces I read in your report that I thought was really helpful um, is sort of, and, and we, I really do hope everyone, if you have a, an hour or so to read it, um, but one of the great pieces of it is giving you examples based on whether you're on a college campus, you're at a K through 12 school, mm -hmm. um, you're out reaching to your mayor, right? Like there are stakeholders in every part of our communities. Yeah. So whether you're a college student um, and you want to weigh in with your administrators and ask them to be very clear and visible on what their policies are to protect all students or um, weigh in with your mayor or your local leadership yeah. um, and being really clear to everyone in the community that mm -hmm. they are all 
um, welcomed and they're all going to be protected. And a part of the community. And I just want to correct, I meant Jersey City, not the city of New Jersey. Jersey City. <laughs> shout out to Jersey City. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> shout out to Annapolis and Birmingham and Columbus, Ohio, and other folks that are getting sanctuary cities passed along, just doing exactly what Joe just said. And I wanted to highlight there's a petition at Color of Change that's also a United We Dream petition to ask your mayor to be um, to, to enact a sanctuary policy. Great. Yeah, okay. Sure. And we have, how do I know if my community is a sanctuary city? I think, great question. Well, I think the first thing is to look on your city website. Usually they will have press releases about um, recent policies they've enacted. You can also call the city clerk's office and ask whether they are honoring or whether the police department is honoring or honoring federal immigration detainers or cooperating in any way with the federal federal government on immigration enforcement. You can get those information, it should be, that information should be public information. If it's not public information, the other thing you can do is, as, as you, anyone can actually submit a uh, freedom of information request to get that information from your local government. But the best thing to do is, is check your city website, your local county or city website. And hopefully, um, I'm not talking out of turn, but perhaps the Conference of Mayors, yeah. which is a hub of, of mayors um, and other city stakeholders might have initiatives there. I know um, Mayor Garcetti, I believe runs um, one of sort of the Latino or immigrant uh, advisory okay. boards or something that might have a little more information that's all in one place for folks who are looking. Yeah, and then the, there's another resource we'll provide in the links below from the National Immigration Law Center that actually lists, has a running list, and, and I think also the Immigration Legal Resource Center has a running list of all the jurisdictions and the types of different policies that they have. Okay, mm -hmm. and we're going to take one more question. Conservatives on the Supreme Court have advocated for states' rights. Where will they fall in sanctuary cities? And we have a legal eye in our audience. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, yeah, I think um, if they're following, um, if they're following the jurisprudence of the late Justice Antonin Scalia, who was a states' rights advocate um, in his in his jurisprudence, and they're following the Prince case, the New York case, and the Sebelius case then it is a state's rights argument. It is a 10th Amendment argument, and the city of San Francisco recently sued um, the executive branch on those grounds, um, sued Donald Trump on those grounds on the t under the 10th Amendment. So it is a true state's rights argument, but I think at the same time, as Kathy and I discussed in the report, we look at that through an equal protection, a civil rights, a human rights, and a racial justice lens. So it's important to understand that states have these rights, and part of that state's rights argument is to protect and include everyone and avoid liability under the 14th Amendment, under equal protection, mm -hmm. to make sure that nobody is experiencing racial discrimination. Do you want to add anything to that? No, I, was, okay. I mean, that was just a great summary. I guess I would also add that we are very clear that we don't want to have you know, a state's rights argument per se, right? Yeah. It's very important to have criminal justice reform. Um, it's very important to make sure that you know the, the demos, the people at the local level have their own rights to an inclusive democracy that's based on the principles that we want in our communities. So we know there are 11.4 million undocumented people. They are our friends, neighbors. They are part of our community. Right. And we want them to right. feel safe and included. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And at Volta Latino, we want to make sure that we're being helpful and bringing you all of the information that you need. Um, so if you have other questions that we didn't touch upon today, please leave the questions. We will try to work our way back to include links and resources. Um, and perhaps on a, on a, to end on a, a note of, of friendship and love, as the day calls, we want to remind folks that our partners at Forward US are also hosting a campaign today that is um, sort of a, a love note or a friendship note to an immigrant. Or if you're an immigrant yourself, it's um, hashtag Sending love to an immigrant, I believe, today. Sorry if I got it wrong forward, but um, you can check out their, their campaign today, which calls for a, a note or a picture online um, that sends a positive note to the immigrant community. Um, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for engaging with us. Um, we are here for you, and so we encourage you to continue participating. And show some love for Sanctuary Cities. Yes. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. Feliz Dia de San Valentin.